All right, we are live. It looks like we have uh, everyone on the horn. So, um, HPA, thank you everyone for joining tonight's Health and Human Service special uh, meeting. Uh, today, September 9th, uh, 2020, I would ask everyone to please mute your phones if you're not speaking. Um, thank you. Um, so HPA TV will be broadcasting tonight's uh, Health and Human Service meeting live on Comcast TV channel 96 and Frontier TV channel 6032. It will also be streamed live on hpatv.org and the HPA TV Facebook page. It will then be made available for future viewing on the HPA TV YouTube channel. So we only have one agenda item tonight, but uh, I want to be able to go around the horn and uh, introduce folks. So uh, in, in order of the tiles that I see, why don't we start with Councilwoman Rossetti and then just say if you're a voting member or not. I am Councilwoman Rossetti. Hello, everyone. I am a voting member. Am I a voting member? Yes. yes I'm a voting member. Yes. Uh, Councilman Gale. And John Gale, and I believe I'm also a voting member of this committee. Uh, director. Leanne Arroyo, Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, and Eli. Yes, Eli Mercado, Committee li Liaison for the Office of Councilman Nick LeBron. All right, so with thank you. With that being said, we have uh, one agenda update, and that is uh, an update from Director Liani Arroyo. The floor is yours. Great. I just wanted to have an opportunity to inform you on where we're at with the coronavirus in the city because I know there's been some news articles about increases in the number and looking at um, some smaller spikes that have happened across the state, most notably Danbury and outbreaks. So <clears throat> I do just want to um, inform anyone that for the week starting uh, August 16th and the week starting August 23rd, we did see an increase over the previous weeks. Um, the numbers there were 54 for we, the week starting um, August 16th and then 51. So we went down a little bit the week uh, starting August 23rd. We are doing a Sunday to Saturday week to mirror what the state is doing with their metrics. And so thus far where we're at for this past week, which started um, August 30th, we are at 28 cases. So it looks like the numbers are starting to come back down. Um, many of the cases that we saw in the previous two weeks where our numbers increased, I would say about half of those cases, we were able to connect the dots to either small family gatherings, to um, other outbreaks that are happening around us. I think you all saw there was um, an outbreak in East Hartford with the mattress factory. So we were able to tie some of our cases there and then spread that happen. Um, within a family because of a, a worker being exposed. And so uh, the good news is we are able to track those cases. Our contact tracing is going well. People are working with us and giving us that information. Um, in spite of that increase, our a test positivity rate remains um, at slightly below 2%, which is great, well below the 5% threshold that's that are that's set out by the scientists. And so, as you all know, school reopened today. Um, I took my oldest daughter to school today. My youngest one will go tomorrow, but schools, um, the metrics continue to support school reopening and some level of in-person learning. So I remain um, in close contact with the superintendent and her team as things change or as things um, we get aware of new information. I've been alerting her, but I just wanted to make sure that you were all aware that we did see um, a slight increase that occurred. We uh, That slight increase was highest that first week. It has started to tick down. Um, sometimes the numbers that the state reports are a little different than what I will report because they're including all the cases that we get notified of in a, in a particular week. And sometimes those cases are from previous weeks. So it doesn't not actually reflect what's happening in the community. So if I get cases, I might get a case that comes in this week and it was from three weeks ago. And so we will still do follow up on that case, even though it's outside of the window, but the state will report it as a case this week in their numbers. And what we're reporting are the actual cases of people that tested positive in a particular week. So um, just want just want you all to be aware of that. The other thing is the state is also um, you will see a resolution that will be presented that that was submitted to the clerk. Um, 
That resolution is about a, a $1.3 million uh, funding that we're getting from the state of Connecticut. The state of Connecticut um, received a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so they are passing through $20 million of that grant to local health departments to help with our um, ability to enhance our ability to track, trace, contain, test, and do everything around COVID and enhance our ability to do that. It is for two and a half years, the grant. And so are three years, I think, 30 months, 30 months. Um, so a 30 month grant. And so um, we will be putting together the, the sort of final say of what we would like to use that money for um, in this upcoming week, because the state requires that from us. But we will be receiving one point, a little slightly over $1.3 million in um, pass through funding from, from the state. I believe we have the highest amount of funding. That the amount of funding is based on several things. It's based on the poverty rate, the case rate. Um, in, in our uh, jurisdiction as well as the population. So because of that, um, we, I believe, are receiving pretty much the highest amount of money. Um, but it is, it'll be really well needed money. It'll enhance the work that we're already doing with the CDC Foundation and the search staffing that they've provided us and will allow us to bring on some staff, additional staff members to help with the work that we'll, we um, have forthcoming. So those are all things that um, are coming through. We also did receive word, um, and this one doesn't require a resolution because they're just increasing a grant that we've already received that you all have approved already. Um, but we also received word that we received um, additional funding from the CDC uh, through our REACH grant. So that money will help us do some work around flu. And so, you know, everyone's talking about the interaction be between flu and COVID. Uh -huh. So what we have normally found in the city, at least through the health department, is that many people don't get vaccinated in our community. And there's many reasons for that. Um, but the funding that we have received will allow us to do some research with the community, as well as do some activities to increase the rate of individuals that are getting um, vaccinated against the flu. Our hope is that by increasing the rate of vaccination in the city, that can help us um, you know, make a distinction. Is it flu or is it COVID, right? And that can help us sort of think through that. So those are just some items that I wanted to inform you about that you will be seeing and announcements that will be made. I thought it was important um, that you have that information from me as well. So thank you, Director, for uh, giving your COVID update as well as, um, uh, thank you, Director, for giving your COVID update as well as um, informing uh, the Health and Human Service Committee about the increase in funding to a grant that was already that we already approved, and then also about this new grant from the state. So I have a couple questions, but I want to open up the floor to uh, my council colleagues, uh, folks. Do you guys have any questions, uh, Councilwoman Rosetti? So first of all, thank you. Nice to see you uh, again. You know, I've been. I've been tracking the data on my own spreadsheet on my laptop since the inception and my numbers match up with yours, but that's another obsession. So I just wanted to, as I have in the past um, with my other hat, I wanted you to know that we have now, as you know, we were doing every other, every other week testing at the open hearth. We went to every month in July, we were negative, people have you know, for the most part, most of the clients are back to work in the outside world. We just had another month, August, whatever that Wednesday was, last 20, whatever it was, and we had negatives again. So every time we have a building, we, we're keeping our capacity and the state contracts are allowing us to do that under the hundred, um, you know, and we are working, you know, with you, Liani, all the time and Elijah, but we're, we we have a process, knock on wood, we feel that's working pretty well as far as admission. And we also just received a grant. We're going to be able to put in a single bathroom in a room. So when men, you know, if we do have to isolate or and or even quarantine more than we could be one, but it also could be a few more. The, the big thing was always the bathroom. You know, they had to walk by other people or use a bathroom that. So that's just the update. So if you look at our world as a snapshot, you know, um, we're, we're trying to do what we can do. Uh, one question I would have of you, I'd be interested, do you find that when you do have the cases or contract tracing, are, are they mostly tracked back to group events? 
So I will say of the ones that we've been seeing in the last couple of weeks, about half of them have been tied to other outbreaks that we're aware of or that the state is aware of. So we've had, um, you know, small outbreaks that have been contained, um, not in our jurisdiction. So there was the one that um, I think it was East Windsor announced last week. We know that there's been um, a church as well that had a couple cases that we were working with a neighboring jurisdiction on. So we had some cases from there. So what we were seeing was um, spread that someone was attended that, uh, uh, worked at that place or attended that church, got sick and then infected family members. Um, so we were seeing that some um, some of those individuals infected other family members through um, small family events. So we had a couple of cases tied to that. So they didn't live in the same house as the initial, uh, who we think is the initial person that came into the house infected, but they attended another event with that individual. So they were tied that way. So I would say that what we're seeing is um, one person, uh, either uh, being connected to another outbreak or having been exposed someplace else and bringing it into the home and having some spread that way. Um, so, you know, that that's obviously not something we want to see. And so we're going to be increasing our efforts around communication, around getting tested um, and ensuring that even when you're home, if you know that you've been exposed to still try and maintain some of that distance and provide some more guidance about being able to do that in, um, in closed spaces. So that's some of the stuff that because of what we're seeing through the contact tracing that we're going to bring out. Well, I was just on a call on um, the governor's municipal leaders call that health directors, uh, mayors, first selectmen, emergency managers and directors um, from across the state are on and the um, our public health, our acting commissioner for the Department of Public Health did say that um, two things that, that we're seeing is that younger people are becoming infected. And by younger, we're talking about the young adults, those 19 to like 30 year olds um, are becoming a, a larger percentage of our cases. And we're seeing that here in the city that's being borne out across the state as well as nationally um, and seeing more cases being tied to small family gatherings. People, people assume, well, they're my family member. I think they're, you know, they're, they're telling me they're quarantined. They're telling me they're being safe. And so they might have a small event, again, well within the guidance of maybe there's just 10 people or 12 people and they're outside and or they're inside and they may be unknowingly spreading it because something's in, someone is an asymptomatic carrier. So we're seeing some of that here as well, which is why the testing is critically important and why we've made that effort to let people know um, if you're going out and you are an essential worker and you're interacting with people, it would be prudent to get tested on a fairly regular basis just to make sure that you're not bringing something back home. I uh, just want to add, um, Councilman Lebron as well, on the um, homeless shelter side, we have seen one of our homeless shelters come back um, from the hotel into the city. So South Park Inn has um, brought back their residents. Um, they have reduced their census, just as Councilman Rossetti has said, and the state continues to honor the, those contracts. But um, we worked with them to um, establish some safety, some safety tips there that can help prevent spread. So they've put up some barriers around their bed. We brought in a uh, building code, a uh, building code enforcement. We brought in the fire marshal. So between all three departments, we were able to provide some guidance and feedback. And I went and I took a look. It looks great. We also know that the Immacare shelter is um, will be reopening shortly. So we're meeting with them next week to talk through COVID precautions as well, because they, um, unlike the rest of our colleagues, they were not a part of all of this COVID rush because their shelter had been closed for um, renovations. And so we're meeting with them as well. We do know that the um, state will continue to hotel a small percentage of our homeless residents, particularly those that may be in shelters that aren't well suited for COVID or to um, initiate or uh, create some COVID prevention type um, things within the shelter. So we will continue to work with them. Um, McKinney continues to remain in the hotel at this point in time. So we'll be working with them and working to see what we can do at the McKinney shelter um, in preparation for them coming back at some point. So directly on that note, um, uh, on that note the, uh, there has been some um, uh, word back um, regarding the folks that, who are returning back to shelters in terms of the items that, um, that they had brought to, show, to hotels 
and then weren't allowed to bring items back to the shelters. And so stuff had to be thrown away. Do you know if that is the case? I am not aware of that. That was not shared with me. Um, you know, I know that sometimes there's issues with bed bugs, there's issues with space and things of that nature, but that has not been made aware of me. I have not heard that. Nick, that wouldn't really make any sense. I do know yeah. that we are always very, as she said, you know, over diligent about bed bugs. So if there was a concern right. about that, that might be it. But I, I, you know, other than that, that doesn't sound, you know, we let people bring things in when they're, right. when they, right. when they, you know, come in. So I don't know, maybe there's a little piece missing in that. Sure, sure. That's, I just wanted to just make sure. Um, and we did, provide, or anything. we did provide the transportation for South Park and the city has been providing transportation um, as there's been movement between hotels or between shelters and hotels and now hotel, the hotel and back to the shelter. And um, they did several runs to be able to um, accommodate people's belongings mm -hmm. as well as ensuring that there was social distancing on the bus. So I do know they're allowed to bring back belongings. Um, they were allowed to bring stuff to the hotel and they're allowed to bring things back because um, our contractor for the transportation for them did do several runs in order, again, to accommodate their belongings and social distancing on that bus. Yeah, thank yeah. you for the update. I just wanted to just make sure, because oftentimes, you know, and, and, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, but, you know, this is their everything, this is their world. And so for folks having to, you know, um, discard, you know, items um, is very, you know, can, very disheartening, but um, doesn't sound like that the case. Thank you for accommodating. Uh, Councilman Gale, is there any questions that you have? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, several questions for you, um, uh, Director Arroyo. Um, and, and, and some of which is just, some of my questions are just putting information out there because there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff people need to know, a lot of stuff I need to know, but, um, so let's just start with that, with the last, uh, thing we've been talking about, which is, uh, you know, those those folks uh, uh, that have been housed in homeless shelters that, that ended up in hotels. Um, what's the status today, September 9th, in terms of um, how many pe how many homeless are uh, being put up in hotels that are, um, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if the city's paying for it, if the state's paying for it, but if you could explain who's paying for what and who these people are, and then which of our shelters and uh, are, are back online and how that's all functioning? Sure. So at the, be the beginning of the pandemic, the city did put out some money to house people in hotels. We made that decision because we knew that we, particularly with the McKinney shelter, because it is a congregate living facility, it's bunk beds, there are no private rooms, that we could not safely keep our um, individuals, our residents that are experiencing homelessness safe with COVID and that type of thing. It would just be right for an outbreak. And that also given the fact that many of our um, residents who are experiencing homelessness also have other comorbidities, <laughs> we thought that was the best thing to do. So we worked closely with Journey Home to identify those most at risk at the McKinney shelter, as well as those most at risk staying in our um, warming center to move them to the hotel. So we did pay for a, uh, maybe it was maybe about two to three weeks uh, for 17 rooms, I believe it was. So about a total of maybe 30 to 35 to 40 individuals were staying at a hotel. The state shortly thereafter picked that up and they moved everyone and consolidated everyone into one hotel. The state picked up the bill at that point in time. We are in the process of seeking FEMA reimbursement for the stay that we paid for, and so we'll be continuing to work on that. Um, but the state has been picking up that bill since April. Our, again, our, our piece of it was maybe two and a half weeks, three weeks max, from mid-March to maybe early April. We have not paid for a hotel since then. The state has picked that up. State Department of Health has picked that up. So um, right now, the state is in the process of consolidating the, the whole number of hotel rooms. At one point, the Greater Hartford can had individuals spaced into two hotel rooms, uh, into two hotels, sorry. Um, 
And so as uh, more people were being rehoused because of the funding that came through, uh, that then um, we were able to then condense everyone into one hotel. So right now that hotel, I don't have the exact numbers. Um, I, the, the meeting is usually on Mondays and since the, this Monday was a holiday, um, but I know that those numbers continue to go down and those numbers are going down um, in a couple of ways. One is we're housing people people are realizing that if they don't figure out a way to self-resolve, they're gonna end up back in a shelter. So some of them are finding ways to self-resolve and working with their family members to go to go with them or friends or roommate situations. Others are getting their apartments because of the increase in um, uh, down payment, um, security deposit assistance. So that's also happening. And then those that are unable to are going back into um, the hotel. So at this moment, um, um, the whole the the shelters that have that we have uh, that have individuals at the hotel is really the McKinney shelter because uh, Councilman Rosetti Open Hearth stayed stayed in place and they shel they basically uh, sheltered in place and and created some protocols there. Um, Imacare has not been functional because they've under renovation, so they've been doing outreach and supporting doing other support work, but not housing people. South Park Inn has just recently come back, and then. Our other shelter, which was a family shelter, uh, Marshall House has always had individual rooms, so they did not move people out. We did bring in um, into the hotels. I know some individuals from the East Hartford Family Shelter as well. The East Hartford Family Shelter does um, support many Hartford residents. Um, if you recall, with the can, um, if you're if you're in the Greater Hartford area, you enter the can and you find a bed in the shelter that's available, and that shelter could be in the city of Hartford or it can be in one of the other cities. And then I also know that into the hotel, we also put additional individuals from our warming center um, that we closed at the end of May. So we uh, um, offered the ability to move them into the hotels as well. Um, and then we had some individuals, I believe from the Enfield warming center that joined into the city um, for the hotels, for the hotel stay as well. Again, those numbers have gone down. Um, there is a plan that has been put in place by the CAN through CCEH, which is the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, has been working with the CANs to house people and to help them house people. So that's happening. And then some of the CARES Act funding that we received um, will also be going to Journey Home that you all approved a couple, maybe about a month or so ago now, the distribution of those CARE funds. Um, Journey Home will also have re receiving funding to help the shelters uh, do outreach, do rehousing and things of that nature. So there is a plan in place. DOH has been at the table. Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness has been working with all the cans across the state, including Journey Home, who oversees our can here, to be able to get people housed. That's the goal is to really try and get people housed because we've had this influx of funding that exists right now. May, may I say something about that? Ooh. Uh, you know, I I again I sound like a broken record, but you know, just watching what some of the other cans did across the state, we just from day one, I mean, certainly Liani was on it, the mayor was on it, you know, they looked at that population as the most vulnerable, they knew how important it was, and, and I'm going to say that doesn't always happen, and, you know, the, the, the New Haven can and the Fairfield, Greater Hartford, they were really up against something even quicker than we were because by the time it started, they had so many cases. But what we were able to accomplish, I just want you to guys to know how amazing it was, what you know, Dr. Arroyo did to really get people a place for quarantine where we have a couple of state contracts. I don't want to name the state agencies, but one was like, hey, you're kind of on your own, figure it out. And if it wasn't for our city helping us do that, it, it wouldn't have worked. So I really, I say this all the time, but I, I'll never be able to say it enough because it really was amazing. Well, you know, and we, we knew this from the beginning. We, we knew we had a good pick for, for uh, health director uh, here, uh, but that, you know, kudos to, to, you know, for all of this. And thank you for those comments, uh, Marilyn. Um, what, what's a CAN, by the way? I know you said it earlier, but say it again. The Coordinated Access Network. I was going to say, I just wanted to show my uh, skills that I've You kicked the can. No, it's it, it, back probably, not that you need this, but, you know, back uh, I uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, probably seven years ago, 
when they really, you know, took 211 as a way to come into the homeless system, they made the different counties coordinated access networks and then all the agencies. And it's not just so the can and Hartford could have the veterans. It could have, you know, all the things that would be a part of that provider network. Or but it's a, but it's a regional, the, it's it's regional, regional based on county. Yeah. Yeah. So of course the greater Hartford can is the best can. But, you know, <laughs> of course. And I have a couple other questions if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, looking forward uh, you know, getting out of the specifics now of you know what 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 we did with the with the homeless population, but just looking forward to the entire Hartford population. Um, I wonder if you could just talk for a minute about what you see happening as September rolls into October, and, and I'm thinking in terms of and, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I've I've heard a, a, a number of people say that sunlight kills the virus and that. You know, when you're out there in the middle of the summer and you're you're socially distanced, uh, the virus has a diff more difficult time trans uh, transferring from one person to another. And now we're going to be entering a time where there's less sunlight. People are going to be staying more inside. Um, what what can we look forward to, and what what advice is the city giving um, to to help us not have a second wave here in Hartford? So I think there's a couple of things. I think conventional wisdom was when you think about the flu, um, and that's what we were comparing to this virus to originally, when we didn't know that much about it, the comparison was to the flu. And so the conventional wisdom was in the hot, hotter weather, the flu wanes. I think we can all know, we can all see, and it's been proven that that's not true for the coronavirus. Our southern states which got hit, you know, got hit the hardest over the summer. And when it's hot and humid, and I lived in Atlanta for five years, so I know it's hot and humid in Atlanta. And um, I lived in Arizona for a little while too. So it's hot out there and it didn't change anything around this virus. So I think the bigger concern right now is we know that transmission indoors is more efficient. And so because it's gonna get cold in the Northeast, people are naturally gonna be gravitating indoors. They're naturally all of those sort of outdoor events that you were having. Um, if you you know have a, a child with a birthday, you're gonna do it outside in the summer. In the winter, you're gonna do it inside. And so those naturally occurring events that happen in people's lives are gonna start happening inside again. And because we know that transmission is more efficient inside, if you um, sneeze and you can aerialize it inside of an apartment, that's not the same as doing that outside, right? So it'll dro the droplets will be likelier to drop if you're outside because of some of the things you're talking about, humidity and things like that. But inside transmission, it's very efficiently transmitted inside. And so the concern is that we need to remain vigilant. We need to have our community understand that any type of event, any type of um, social gathering, even if it's a small one, just five people or 10 people, if it's not with the immediate house, the immediate me members of your family that live in your household, um, there's always a risk. And so we want to continue to remind individuals of that. We also want to remind individuals to get their flu shot. We don't want to have to worry about people getting sick with the flu and COVID. We don't know if that can happen. It likely very well can happen. And so you'll have a, dub a double whammy, as some people are saying, the flu vid being diagnosed with the flu and COVID. We haven't seen that yet, um, but it can happen. And so we want to remind people to get their flu shot, um, at least to give them some sort of protection. And, you know, we never know how accurate the um, how effective the flu shot is until the end of the season. But even any type of protection against the flu at this point in time is better than no protection. So reminding people and encouraging people to do the flu shot, which is that um, additional funding that we got through another grant will be helping us to do that. And also really um, pushing on the community and getting more information from the community about why are they uh, reluctant to get the flu shot and uh, sort of addressing some of those concerns that have occurred in our community. Uh, uh, Councilwoman Rosetti just asked about flu clinics. We normally don't hold flu clinics because we don't get a lot of people, but we will be holding one, at least one this year. Um, uh, we're working with, with CROG, 
to do a regional um, a regional flu clinic to bring down to bring all the resources of our region um, to come together. We have to do it for a grant. Um, and they well, for a grant, we have to do a regional thing and we want to do a flu clinic here. So we will be working to do that. Um, we have ordered, I think, 100 or 200 doses. We have we can order more and get access to more. But part of this will also be partnering with our partners that already exist in the community that give flu shots. So we can work together, have more people get vaccinated, do more mobile clinics with the flu and get get people um, up to date on that. So. I would say those are the two primary messages that we have right now is really avoiding um, any interaction or any uh, sort of gatherings of people that are not in your immediate family. Not um, as some people say in your pod, people are creating pods, they're quarantining and then coming together as families to create a pod. Um, just really trying to be mindful of that. And if you are going to congregate, even if their family wear your mask, that's like that's the easiest thing that you can do. It's wear your mask. Uh, so, you know, we do understand that sometimes things have to happen. So wear your mask um, and then get get uh, get vaccinated for the flu and get tested and get tested regularly. If you're someone that's out there, you know, I've been tested four times. Some uh, at the beginning, it was because I was helping to work in the isolation center and I was in and out of the isolation center. So I knew that um, I had potential exposure to that, even though I was masked and I was six feet away, um, there was exposure. So I was making sure that I got tested and I've been tested after because I'm sending my girls to school. My girls have been tested. So I want that to, to sort of be the message for individuals. Um, in order to make that message effective, we need to be able to connect our community members who have many needs with the resources they need in order to quarantine or in order to isolate. So we're working on that right now. Um, we were funded for the $850,000 grant that you all approved the resolution for that we applied and um, we received word that we were funded. So we'll be hiring um, 20 community health workers through community-based organizations here in the city. Um, so those individuals are gonna be individuals that can help our community members um, learn what they need to learn about isolating and quarantining and then connecting them to resources that may be available. So those are the things that we'll be pushing. And as we get more information, we'll push more information out. But one of the next big things I would say, um, you know, there's lots of talk about the vaccine. We're gonna be doing that research with the funding that we received from the CDC Foundation on the vaccine. What will it take for our community to become vaccinated? What will it take for um, for uh, the black, uh, black individuals in our community and Latino individuals in our community, immigrants in our community to um, want to become vaccinated? Who are those messengers? What do they need to know? Who do they need to know? Who do they need to hear it from? And where do they need to hear it at? Um, those are the questions that we're working on so that we can also prepare our community for what we hope will be an eventual vaccination at some point early next year. So I can, I can, tell, you, I can tell you, is that the echo? Okay, we got, got to get you muted to get rid of that echo. Um, so I can tell you, I can tell everybody, uh, I got the flu shot and, uh, and I got it at CVS and it's free. Uh, and, you know, we got a bunch of CVSs around Hartford, so, uh, you know, we can spread the word. I mean, it, 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 you know, not only is it free, but uh, I have to compliment CVS. I mean, I went in there to pick up a prescription, and, you know, while I'm picking up the prescription, uh, they're saying to me, well, Mr. Gale, would you like a flu shot? Uh, Mr. Gale, it's free, and I can do it for you right now. And, okay, I mean, say no more. I did it. Um, so uh, make that uh, yeah I want to make that comment um, it, it, as far as the testing goes uh, I've been tested twice um, uh, and the second test I got at the Arroyo Center I thought that was absolutely phenomenal we made a, an appointment to go in at nine o'clock in the morning six members of my family we all got there we got tested we got our results within 20 minutes by 9 30 we were out of there um, so tell me where do we have I mean, that's the Arroyo Center. Uh, that's a rapid test. Do we have other rapid tests in Hartford? And maybe you can just pick off where the testing centers are. Sure. Um, the only rapid testing center that I know of is the Arroyo Center. There may be um, some private providers that are doing that. As far as at this moment, I don't know um, who they are, but the only sort of big center we have is Arroyo. We do have 12 locations in the city. So there are three CVSs. Washington, Weathersfield, and Blue Hills, the Arroyo Center, which is also run by CVS. Um, our FQHCs are also doing testing. So community health um, 
services is doing testing, ongoing testing of their clients, and they have a loose definition of who their clients are. Anyone they've seen in the last three years qualifies as a client for them. The um, intercommunity is also doing testing. Uh, Wheeler uh, is doing testing. Uh, Charter Oak also is doing testing. And then I'm trying to think, so we have Hartford Hospital and St. Francis Hospital also. And then um, my understanding is uh, the Aero Pharmacy and the West End and Farmington is also doing testing. So, um, and they have a website, you can go on the website, you make an appointment, you get a voucher, you can go in because I called them and asked them about this a couple weeks ago. I feel like I'm missing one more site that I can't remember right now, but those are the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Community Health Center on New Britain with the pediatric practice is also doing testing. Several of those partners are also doing our mobile testing events. So Charter Oak is doing mobile testing and their community is doing mobile testing. Uh, community health centers doing mobile testing, uh, uh, Charter uh, Trinity and um, as is Hartford Healthcare. So they're also doing some testing events. They have a contract with the state to do uh, testing in specific communities. And so all of those partners have contracts with the state to do testing as well on a mobile basis. And so we're working with them um, to identify locations, identify places and get them there. Uh, mobile testing is a lot of work. It takes a lot of resources. And so we're not that large of a city and we have uh, 12 sites that are doing testing. So we're really trying to make sure that people are also using those sites because we don't wanna lose any of those sites because um, you know, being set up with PPE and all of that is labor intensive. And so we do want to make sure that we're pushing people to those sites as much as possible. And then many private providers are also doing testing as well. So um, testing is definitely much more widespread now than it was before. Um, but I always do encourage people to go to our community sites, to our FQHC partners, um, because we what I've seen and how we get the data back is that if because the state has um, prioritized um, with Quest the processing of our of our samples and because some of our um, partners, testing partners are using Jackson Labs here in the state to process tests, uh, I see a faster turnaround with tests that are being done by our partners than I would see from a private provider. Thank you, Dave. Last, uh, last question here. Um, uh, you, you, you talked about the concern as we get into the fall and going indoors. Um, and, and of course, the, the, it strikes me that the big concern on everybody's mind is what happens when the kids go back to school. Um, and, and now that's going to introduce a whole new element of uh, uh, exchange between our young folks who are then going to be bringing it home where we have multi-generational families and um, a uh, tremendous amount of concerns. Uh, and I want to sort of bring this back full circle to the to the grant that we're here to talk about uh, and how you intend to spend the money and have you uh, talk about how how your department is interacting with the school system and uh, how much of this, um, uh, this effort is going to be um, in collaboration with the school system uh, to try to make sure that um, you know, those kids are in as safe an environment as possible, but then that when they come home, uh, we're, we're making sure that the, um, the home environment is as safe as possible. So let, let us know. So I've been working hand in hand with um, Hartford Public Schools and uh, CREC here in the city. Um, I'm doing some outreach to our private schools and our charter schools. Um, as you know, that's been noted to me, it's been noted to many of our fellow health directors, but I felt that um, I wanted to concentrate on these two larger institutions and then bring everyone in. So outreach is happening this week to um, our, our charter schools and our private schools in, in the community. So I've been working hand in hand with them. I also sit on the state, uh, the, the State Department of Education and the State Department of Public Health created a um, subset of the state rules committee to look at rules and guidance and um, uh, communication between educators and the school systems and parents and students and also looking at what is needed to keep our children as well as the staff in those schools stay in safe. So I've been sitting on that committee as a representative of large cities. What I will say is that everything is truly being guided by the science. I think we have a unique opportunity because our rates are low 
to uh, be able to get kids into school at this point in time. Um, nothing is risk free. Let's just be clear. Nothing is ever risk free. But in a, in a, I think a safe environment as possible. I think the rules that now have been brought down by the state that everyone has to wear a mask in schools. Initially, younger children did not have to wear masks based on the experience that we had with the early childhood centers, but that has now changed. I think is helpful. Um, I, you know, I, I would say that um, our, my interaction with both school systems is on a daily basis. We have a daily standing call to talk about any issues that exist. Um, both the superintendent as well as her staff have my cell phone number and have used it when needed. Uh, and so we remain in pretty much daily contact. I'm in daily contact with someone in both systems, um, either via phone call, via Zoom, via, uh, via email. Uh, those daily phone calls will continue. Uh, everything else that I'm looking at in terms of how we manage the pandemic is with an eye to the keeping the numbers low enough so that we can safely keep our children in school for as long as possible. I think we have, like I mentioned, an opportunity to do that. Our youth have many challenges that are oftentimes best served by being in there. Um, you know, we are also looking at other possibilities. What can we do around testing? So that's something that's being discussed that we're trying to figure out. Um, and so have been working with the state on that and local partners on that as well. Um, but at this point in time, what I've seen from the plans, the feedback that I've given, the feedback that the state DOE has given um, has been right on the money to try and keep as many people as safe as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Director Arroyo, so I have one last question for you. And uh, I know it's always one item, but you're always so informative and I feel like um, you know, um, you provide messaging to community members uh, through our platforms, and so it's always beneficial. But I have one question, and uh, I, my ears kind of perked up. You said for this grant, it's a 30-month grant, and it's a COVID 30-month grant. My alarm was raised around that. Are we expecting 30 months of COVID? So I can't say that we will or we won't. <laughs> Some of the grant is uh, backdated to May. That's what happens. So we just received word that we got it. We knew the state was getting it. I think they received word maybe in late May that they got it. Um, the, the date on the grant is, I believe, starts May 19th of this year. So are we expecting 30 months? So if you look at it from May, we're like four months into it or three months into it now. Um, if you look at it, that... Uh, any viable vaccine that we're hearing about is likely not to hit the market until um, maybe late this year, early next year. Uh, anyone that will be vaccinated by that will likely be first responders. And so uh, when you think about how long it will take for a vaccine to hit everybody, uh, it could potentially be a good year and a half to two years before everyone that uh, needs access to the vaccine has access. So yes, uh, you know, we have to look at this as a long game. Uh, this will be around with us. It may not be at the level that it is now. It could even be at a lower level than we are right now. Um, but it's likely to be around for a little bit. Uh, 30 months, I can't say for sure it's 30 months. Um, but at least a year and a half, I would say, uh, until we can probably get enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody. And it will also depend on everyone wanting to be vaccinated. Right. So if that's the case, and it's 30 months that we have, and um, I guess the question becomes, you know, I mean, I, I guess we're all hoping for the day where, you know, we can close the chapter on coronavirus. Um, but is that wishful thinking or is it, when do we say that this is over? I get, yeah, let's start with that question. Um. So I think the thing that, uh, that can be said in what I've been reading is that, uh, we're in a pandemic and coronavirus may become, may end up becoming endemic. If you think about the flu, the flu comes around every year. Um, we have a vaccine, you get vaccinated against it every year. It may be the same thing with the coronavirus. We have coronavirus, coronaviruses is a large number of viruses. The flu, I'm sorry, the um, cold virus is a coronavirus. It is with us every year. It may be that our systems adapt and um, the it's not as bad in the future for us. It may be that we have a viable vaccine and you're getting vaccinated every year like you are against the flu. So it's kind of hard to say. I, I read a fascinating article today in the Washington Post about the 1918 flu and how um, all flu uh, 
pandemics after that flu were related to the 1918 flu as a variant of that flu strain. So we could be sort of in the same thing with the coronavirus. Um, and, you know, at this point, it's just really the systems that we set up now help us for anything else that may come in the future. And that's what this grant is really trying to help us do, build our capacity for surveillance, um, build our capacity for contact tracing. And I will say the city of Hartford has been very lucky that, um, you know, despite the budget cuts that have happened in the past, there have been some core functions in my department that have been untouched. And I'm very grateful for that because we do have two epidemiologists. And as soon as we got that first call about our positive case, we were able to immediately begin contact tracing with that case. Um, and at that point in time, there wasn't a lot of information that was coming from the state because we were all sort of trying to figure this out. But we used what we had and we had some knowledge on our team of a staff member that's going to um, have been here nearly 20 years and was with us through H1N1, um, through the swine flu um, in 2009 and was also with us through Ebola. So we were able to tap um, into that and other health departments weren't so lucky. So I think we have a, a opportunity to continue building our capacity build the department for the future. As I noted, my staff member is hitting his 20 years, so I don't know if he's going to retire or not, um, but he's eligible. And so I need to make sure that I have him around long enough. And if he's going to retire, that he can bring someone in under him that he can train to keep us ready. Thank you. Thank you. So um, barring no more questions, I did want to just um, uh, state an acknowledgement. Um, so I want to thank you, uh, Director Arroyo, and uh, Chief Freeman and all uh, the team, um, because I think it's important for us to keep reiterating the fact that Connecticut is the best state in the country in terms of low coronavirus numbers, or or at least somewhere near there. And then, in, and, you know, and then Hartford's one of the best cities in the state. So there's a correlation that Hartford may be one of the best. In one of the of, best, Nick. Or they, sorry, the oh, best you. in the universe. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, but you know. And that's kudos to you and the and the leadership team, and um, you know, and also to the uh, my health and uh, human services team members for being here, being so responsive, being so inquisitive, and this and you know promoting the information and and, and helping facilitate things um, and not being log jams in these process. So um, with that being said, um, thank you so much for all your efforts and the whole team's efforts. I think um, kudos to you. I think it's important to continue to reiterate that. So with that being said, uh, 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 no more questions. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, everyone have a good evening. Thank you, take everyone. Care.